The word Duomo is an invented Italian word, okay, which they create by mangling together two Latin words, the first of which is domus, right? English words like domestic, domicile, come from the word domus, it means house, right? And the other word is dei, D-E-I, which means God. So we nickname cathedrals house of God because normally they're so large that symbolically, right, the Almighty could dwell within. If you consider two major Italian cathedrals like Orvieto Cathedral and Milan Cathedral, neither of which have domes, but are referred to as Duomo nonetheless. So when you're in the area, spread the word to everyone you see that Duomo does not mean dome, right? Construction begins in the year 1296, and construction was terminated when they placed the bronze ball way at the top. I call it the cherry on the cake, right? The final garnish to the structure in the year 1468. So the total construction time for the church was 172 years. Something else that's very difficult for Americans to understand. No building project in the US took two centuries to complete. Not even the big dig in Boston, right? Although as one Bostonian said, it felt like it took 200 years to complete or what have you. And part of the reason why this thing took so long is because of its size, right? From front to back, the total length of Florence Cathedral is 152 meters. It's just over a football field and a half in length. And for two centuries, this was by far the largest church in the entire Christian world. Until a basilica in Rome was finally completed called St. Peter's blew this church right out of the water, coming in at 217 meters in length. But what's important to remember is when the churches were built. This one went up in the 13 and 1400s, St. Peter's in the 15 and 1600s. So first Florence, then Rome, as the homes to the world's largest churches. All right, come the next. Now, for those of you who have not been inside the cathedral, uh, I think you'll be surprised by what you do not find and that is a large amount of decoration. There's so much frosting on the outside of this cake that you kind of expect to see the same thing inside, and you really don't, because almost all the decoration is concentrated up there on the inner side of the dome where you will find this image. Right. Anyone like to guess the subject here? The Last Judgment, right? There it is again. It took me all 40 seconds to find you another one of these, all right? So if you are into the violent, sick, and sadistic imagery, you got plenty more material to look at up here on the dome, right? And to be perfectly honest with all of you, it's not the most innovative of paintings in history, but this does qualify as the world's largest fresco painting. You're looking up into 35,000 square feet of fresco, right? Uh, how many of you have been to the Sistine Chapel? 12,000 square feet. This is three times larger than Michelangelo's ceiling. Right? The artist who started the fresco was named Giorgio Vasari, the year 1572. All right, can I have the next? Now, if the cathedral is the religious center of Florence, this building is the political center of the city. Okay? Known almost exclusively as the Palazzo Vecchio. Most of you know that Palazzo is the Italian word for palace, and Vecchio, old. But common sense would dictate that normally you don't build something and call it old immediately, right? So anything vecchio in this city, the Palazzo, the Ponte, those are later nicknames. Original name of the building, Palazzo della Signoria. And when you're standing in the square, right, you are in the Piazza della Signoria. The Signoria was the name that Florence gave to its executive city council, okay? And probably the most important thing I can tell you historically about this city is that during its heyday, Florence was one of the few European republics. Right? We elected our rulers into power. And that makes the city very, very different historically and art historically as well. So this was the building that was the seat of that democracy. Okay? Does that building look like a town hall to any of you? Let me rephrase the question. What does that building look like? Fortress, castle, right? I get prison sometimes. And the reason it looks so much like one is because when it came time for them to build a town hall, they had no idea what town hall should look like because there weren't any, right? In other words, there's no market for this kind of building because democracy was so rare in Europe at the time. So they borrowed the style of the fortress or castle because this is the style that people associated with power and authority, okay? At the same time, it's also a style of architecture that allowed the people who worked inside the building 
to protect themselves from the very people who elected them. Because very often when they made unpopular decisions, i.e. raising taxes and things like this, those people would form into what we call lynch mobs, and they would storm the building and try to string up their politicians, right? Certain analysts today have suggested that we go back to that practice, by the way, but that's a whole separate discussion, right? So the next time you're walking by Palazzo Vecchio, look up into this row of arches, okay? Each arch, which lines up with a window or a door on the ground level, has a rectangular opening or hole in it that faces straight down. And the function of those holes was? They call them drop holes, and you can pretty much let your imagination do the rest, right? Things like boiling oil, boiling tar, rocks, arrows were shot down. On one occasion, tubs of human feces dropped from the openings, right? We have yet to figure out why they were storing that material, by the way, but they figured out a good way of getting rid of it, right? And the moral of the story is not only does it look like a castle or a fortress, it acted like one. The style of the building is a direct reflection of the political climate when it was built, and that climate was anything but stable. We know things calm down when they start putting sculptures in front of this building. And the most famous of those sculptures is right there. Anyone recognize that profile? Michelangelo's David, that's the copy of course, right? But remember that the original David stood in that exact spot for exactly 369 years before being moved into the Academia Gallery, okay? Can I have the next? So we got a lot going on in Florence around the year 1300. We really haven't moved much, right? And a lot of people think that this is the guy, right, after the political and the economic revolution that took place, who begins the artistic revolution that we call the Renaissance, right? Figure, of course, Dante Alighieri, right? Now, Dante is, of course, the author of one of the greatest literary pieces of all time, right? the Divine Comedy. And Dante was born in the city of Florence in 1265. Right? He lived here for the first 35 years of his life, but was exiled in the year 1300. The same people who set up the democracy, <coughs> excuse me, split up into two rival factions, and Dante's faction was kicked out. He spends the remaining 21 years of his life in exile, wrote and published the Divine Comedy in exile, died in exile, right? and here's the most important bit for all of you, whatever is left of him today is still resting in exile. Can okay, I the next? If any of you go down to that Franciscan Church of Santa Croce to see the celebrity tombs, right, that are contained within, people of the caliber of Michelangelo, Galileo, Machiavelli, Rossini, Ghiberti, and you're walking around taking your photos, right? Right next to Michelangelo's, there's this big tomb with the name Dante Alighieri written on it. Don't waste your photos. He's not in there, right? It's a large funerary monument to Dante, okay? In fact, the date on it is 1829, if I remember correctly. Dante rests in a city called Ravenna, right? It's two and a half hours east of Florence on the Adriatic coast. We just pretend like Dante's buried in Florence, right? And the reason I bring this up, I think you're all aware of just how much genius came out of the city of Florence, but the relationships between the city and those geniuses were not always the most friendly. And Dante's is perhaps the most celebrated example, right? And the next. It was, of course, Dante's good friend, Giotto, who was responsible for this painting, right? And I think most of you know, of course, this is one of the treasures of the Uffizi Gallery. Now, what Dante does for literature, right, the writing of the Divine Comedy in the vernacular, is much what Giotto was doing for painting. That is, treating religious subject matter in a very human way, right? And one of the most celebrated examples is, of course, his Madonna and Child. Giotto is always celebrated as being the first painter to definitively break with what we call the Byzantine style. Now, even if you're not familiar with the term Byzantine, you're probably familiar with the style. If you've ever seen a Madonna and Child image where the Virgin Mary looks more like an alien than she does a woman, right? Byzantine. If you've ever seen a Madonna and Child painting where little baby Jesus appears with a receding hairline, he's got the five o'clock shadow going, right? He's got the little stogie hanging on the corner of his mouth. Byzantine, right? Because the Byzantine philosophy was that if I paint Mary to look like you or you or you, no offense to you, right? But if she looks like a regular woman, what's the big deal? but if the Virgin Mary resembles E.T., then it's easier for people to accept her as a goddess, right? Baby Jesus was even more complicated. According to Christians, Jesus is God. So the notion that he was born the way we all were, 
wearing diapers and spitting up on himself and going through potty training and what have you was seen as completely inappropriate. So in the ninth century, the church actually recognized a doctrine called the Puero Doctrine, the man-child doctrine, which maintained that when Jesus Christ was born, he was actually born a small adult who just physically grew in size for 33 and a third years. I'm not kidding. From the moment of birth, he could drive a car, he could watch R-rated movies, he could consume alcohol, right? Which for us is absurd, but was their way of rendering their divinities more divine, okay? Now, Giotto is working against that convention. And although the slide doesn't do it justice, those of you who know the painting can attest, Mary's legs are actually clearly modeled in this painting. Giotto's the first to break out of what I call the paper cutout doll mode of Mary, where body and drapery are one and the same. He's suggesting that there is a human body under that drapery. More importantly, her breasts pushing up against her tunic. So it's not just a human body, it's a female. Her femininity given back to her for the first time in seven centuries, okay? And even more important is the physical contact between mommy and junior. Because most of the time, the Virgin Mary simply points at Jesus. She's like a blinking neon light, you know, pay attention to him, pay attention to him, pay attention. Now instead, her right hand on his right leg and the tips of her fingers here under his left arm. She is cradling and presenting Jesus at the same time. In a single painting, Mary is human, she is woman, and she's a, she's a mom, right? It is a revolution in the history of painting. Go to the next. But if you want to see the first ever Renaissance-style painting, then you need to trek over to that church of Santa Maria Novella right, to see what I think is the most important painting in the entire city of Florence, okay? the Holy Trinity. Subject, right, depicting this notion that God is both one and three. So the older gentleman back there is God the Father, Jesus, of course, here on the cross, and that white thing that you see right there is the dove, right, or the bird that represents the Holy Spirit. Painted by Masaccio in the year 1427, and what makes this painting so extraordinary is that it's the first painting ever in the entire history of art to apply a scientific tool called perspective. This is the first ever painting to use single point or linear perspective, right? Real three-dimensional space on two-dimensional surfaces. A technology that the ancient Greeks never achieved, and for me, surprisingly, the Romans never achieved as well. The first time ever in Masaccio's Trinity. But of course, have the next piece. The Renaissance was not just about science and mathematics. Right? It was also about pure, unadulterated beauty. Right? Now, how many of you are familiar with these doors? And I ask simply because they're often described as the most beautiful doors in the world and the most famous doors, right? The so-called gates of paradise. Right? Ten bronze panels, gilded in gold, right? depicting Old Testament subject matter. You read them left or right, top to bottom, like the pages of a picture book. 